Now we have some awards to present to what we're calling movers and shakers in momentum. So the first award, the first honoree is a preeminent Danish architect and founding partner of the world-renowned design firm Gell Architects. He made human-centered urban planning a thing, and he championed the then novel idea that cities should be designed for people. He has redesigned streets of the largest cities around the world to be more livable, has won nearly every urban planning award there is, and his books have shifted the paradigm of this industry. This Momentum Award winner is Jan Gale. Accepting the award on his behalf is Eben Faulkner, the director of Gale's New York office. Eben. Yeah, do you want to say, you want to say a few words? Sure. I'll say very quick thank you on behalf of Yen and all of my colleagues at Gale. Uh, we're really excited to accept this award in particular because so many of the conversations about smart cities can focus so much on the technology and we've always emphasized people first. So we're very interested in seeing how these conversations about smart cities can continue to ask the question smart for what purpose and smart for whom. So we hope that all of the wonderfully smart people around, this, uh, around the, the room here can continue to keep people at the forefront of their thoughts when it comes to designing cities of the future. Thank you. Welcome, Jan. I am so happy to be able to have this interview with you and, we will, uh, and to celebrate you as a winner uh, of the Newsweek Momentum Awards. So I want to start by saying, okay. go ahead. I'm very grateful for this award and I thank you very much for it and uh, I return the welcome. It's very nice to meet you and it's very nice for me to be able to address the people who are gathered tonight for this event. I want to start by just saying, and for the audience's sake as well, that you, know, you have so many accomplishments. Uh, you started by doing empirical research in the 60s and 70s on how people behave in streets, collecting data on what building design characteristics make a street more or less walkable, more or less enticing to linger in, the kinds of public spaces. That certainly led to your advocacy, so successful in, in pedestrian-oriented public spaces, then books and books, and now a global practice leading in redesigning cities for people. What do you most want the world to learn from your work? Indeed, the start of all this work was the fact that in the early 60s, I married a psychologist, and she and her friends, they always ask why are architects not interested in people? And why did they not, do they not uh, learn anything about people in schools of architecture? And um, that led me to go back to School of Architecture for 40 more years to hear what I had missed, just to find out that nothing was known. In the early 60s, there was no one who thought that the built environment had any major influence on people's behavior, on quality of life. They, the idea was people will adapt. So they're very adaptable. And what, regardless of what we build for them and how many cars we throw into the environments, people will adapt and will be happy ever after. Then we started in the 60s. We started to study more carefully. What does people, how does people use cities? and starting to make people visible in city planning. They were invisible. What was visible was all the traffic engineers, they counted all the cars every year and every day, and nobody counted anything about city life. Copenhagen became, because of the studies we conducted in School of Architecture, became the first city in the world where the life of the city was recorded as carefully as was the traffic of the city. And this has led now almost 60 years later to the fact that Copenhagen has become one of the most people-friendly and livable cities in the world. So it can lead somewhere, this kind of putting people in the center of your concern instead of putting making the cars happy in the center of concern. What are the first steps that communities that are currently very highly reliant on their cars 
like Metro Atlanta, what are the first steps that they can take to encourage more human-powered mobility? The way I have worked is always to start to find out what is happening today. Are people using the streets and how are they using it? And finding out what is the situation today, then we can start to discuss what kind of situation would we want it to be and how can we get from here to here in a number of steps. And that has been very successful city after city, community after community, to have some knowledge and some data when then you can start to talk about how can we change this. We have two important new challenges. We have to do much more to be sustainable because of the climate concern. And the other thing is that we have to combat the sitting syndrome, which is a very serious sickness, which hits many automobile societies, that people sit too much and die too early and have too troublesome a life when they get old. But I'm curious, as your practice has expanded around the globe, do you also find cultural differences changing the way that you redesign cities for people? Of course, there are cultural differences and also maybe even more important, there are regional differences. What you can do in Greenland, what you can do in Arabia and what you can do in Australia or in Japan or in Dhaka in in Bangladesh is very different because of the climate. It's cold, it's too warm, it's too wet, and this influences the way people use the cities very much. And also, of course, to some extent, cultural and uh, uh, religious differences. I have, however, found, and we actually, that coincides with what the DNA people have found, that we are basically the same species all over and we have basically the same senses, we have the same biological history. And in my studies, I found that there's enormous many similarities between how they do in Greenland and Japan and in the Arab countries and in uh, Australia or America because of us being all of us homo sapiens. And then we have some extra layers of culture and we have different regions where we adapt to live. We are trying in all parts of the world to make it possible for people to use their own muscles more, to, to walk more and maybe also to bicycle in many parts of the world. And uh, this is uh, to me very universal because that's what we were made for, that's what the doctors tell us to do. And we've also found that's the cheapest you can do in cities of all the infrastructure, the cheapest you can do is to be good to pedestrians and to bicycles. One exa important example is maybe Colombia, um, uh, Bogota and Colombia, where they've had for a number of years a specific policy of making the poor people more mobile, giving them opportunities to walk to the bus and have a better bus system and also give them bicycle because for years and years, all the investments went to the 20% who had access to cars, while the 80% who had no access got no investments. That has been changed, and that's part of an economic idea that get the not too wealthy people, give them mobility so they can get around in the city and earn their living instead of selling cigarette lighters on the square, little trinkets, whatever that doesn't improve the quality of life in the long run. If reintroducing walking, biking, and sociable public spaces was really the challenge that you took on, what do you see as the emerging challenges for those who are following in your footsteps? I'm sitting here in Copenhagen, which is much, much better than the city was when I was a young person. So my grandchildren are growing up in a city which is much better. And that has made me believe strongly 
in taking the departure point in city planning in Homo sapiens in your body and making the natural things possible as a start. Then we can add technologies and 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 um, automatic cars and drones and whatever and maybe we will be happier that will be shown um, I can doubt it a bit because I really believe in the essentials um, and when we go on holiday we we at, at once advert to the old walking animal and go around and and promenade and and swim and whatever so and we love to go to old cities where we at once revert to the old way and we know that from now from modern housing areas or, or city areas where you are able to walk and to bike people love that in Copenhagen now we are into that 47 percent of all the people going to work or studies in Copenhagen they arrive on their bicycles by now 10 years ago it was 31 percent so now it's 18 percent more the more you invite this kind of behavior we have known for years that if we make more invitation for driving cars what will we have we will have more traffic so the more streets you make the more lanes you more traffic in Copenhagen we have evidence now that if you really cater for the people, for the public spaces, for the bicyclists. You have more people walking, you have more life in the public spaces, and you have more people bicycling. So you can invite for this, or you can invite for that. And that is really a very important finding, because that's a challenge to all of you to ask in all the cities around the world, what would you like to invite for? And what would give your population uh, a better life and maybe also a better health bill in the end. I would like to wish all of you a very nice event tonight in uh, today in Atlanta and a nice dinner afterwards. I will envy you to be in such good company and having such good reasons for celebrating because I know several of the other ones, they are well worth celebrating. Congratulations to the magazine and to all the award winners. Thank you very much.